Should we do this? Let's do it. I think we should do this. All right, guys, I have Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter here. She is a fellow hospitalist. Oh, so good. The pain. The pain <laughs> is universal. At CPMC Sutter Hospital in uh, San Francisco, she is also a philanthropist an executive producer on at least two Netflix documentaries, uh, Extremis and Endgame. And she is the founder of the End Well Foundation. And that is a 503, 50, what is it? 501c3. Something like that, that is a not-for-profit uh, focusing on uh, end-of-life issues, palliative care, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. am I right? Yep. And I am thrilled because I'm here in the Bay Area in this cool rental. How dope is this house, by Amazing the way? house. I, it's like us doctors can't afford a house like this. It's five. It's fifteen hundred square feet. Do you okay. know what the Zillow price is? It's a uh, three point three million dollars. Yeah, I know. <gasps> Elizabeth, I'm coming. Home. Talk about <laughs> palliative care. I need palliation for like the mortgage on a place like that. So right. we're here in this beautiful thing uh, as I'm in the Bay Area doing interviews, and uh, we connected because we've kind of known each other's work. And I was really excited because it always fascinates me that someone can do hospital medicine, particularly nights like you do, and still do other stuff to actually improve the system as a whole. I mean, how did you get into the whole end of life thing and all of that in the first place? Whew. Well, you know, actually it was early on in my residency. So like you, you know, I did, I don't know, four or five ICU months during my intern year. Yeah. Right. I didn't know anything about medicine. I walked into the ICU my first, you know, week of being an intern and just, you know, had my mind completely blown at how stupid I was. Um, but once I... <laughs> I know that of, feeling. Yeah. Right. And once I sort of understood what was going on there, I realized that, you know, what we do in this country is... Um, no matter how old you are, no matter how sick you are, you'll get admitted to the ICU and get aggressive invasive care by default, right? Yep, yep. So that was surprising, somewhat shocking to me. It wasn't something I'd thought about before until I was in that moment. And what I realized is, you know, most of the time, um, A, those patients and families have no idea sort of mm. what's going on. You know, they're not a part of the conversation that lands them, you know, on that In that path. default path. Exactly. Right? They don't even realize it's a default. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. They no. just think, oh, the doctors think this should be done <laughs> because no one's had the conversation. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and how it plays out is, you know, these patients are often getting care that they, they maybe don't want and that they don't understand. Mm. And then it's not in line with their goals and their values of how they've lived their lives, you know. And that to me is what you know, good medicine is, is all about, whether we're talking about the end of life or we're talking about diabetes and high blood pressure. It should be all about tailoring care based on, you know, asking a patient what's what's most important to them. I mean, we talk about shared decision making and yeah. this kind of thing a lot, but it actually is accomplished in the hospital very rarely. It's not the default mode of communication. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, I mean, it what shocked me in ICU is that we spent so much emotional energy and time and money at the end of life and it wasn't what the patient wanted if you really asked them mm -hmm. if you really dug in they would say well no this is what 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 i want if you could ask them what i want is to be comfortable at home most people want to die at home that's right but yet we don't give them that so as a hospitalist there you were kind of uh, uh oh, as an intern uh, as an intern as so an intern. you're doing all these months of icu and, yeah. and did it was it something where you said because I tell you, I had these conversations with myself yeah. where I was like, can I do this for a living? This is, I'm, I'm being paid to torture people until they die. That's how it felt. Mm -hmm. And we had a palliative service, but they were, you know, it was kind of a nascent thing. It was new. Right. Uh, so, I mean. So, luckily, you know, we have a very robust palliative care service at CPMC. So, they provided amazing mentorship for me. And I really sought it out through residency because I saw them as really the only people in the hospital setting that know how to engage in shared decision making, mm. how to sit down and communicate effectively with patients. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that really kind of turned the course for me in terms of what I wanted to, what I wanted to do. You didn't think like a lot of the specialists uh, sometimes will say, oh, these are the guys you call when everyone's given up. So you call the palliative team when, uh, you know, everyone's just, it, it, the oncologist can't uh, pull another nail out of the coffin mm -hmm. and continue to work on the, the, the person who's basically a cadaver at this point, you know, or the, the nephrologist can't do dialysis anymore because all the access is blown. And, and that's when, because that was the sense sometimes I got is it's a failure and you call them in to swoop in. And the patients too have this perception that here come the vultures. Yep. 
Yeah. Have you ever heard that? Before? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that has been the way, yeah. you know, things have happened over, over time. I think it's changing. Um, I think now more medical students have, you know, coursework in palliative care. I think more physicians, especially hospitalists, are on board mm. with the fact that palliative care is an extra layer of support for patients and their families mm. um, who are facing a serious illness and, and can and should be used, you know, at any time during the course of illness, not just the end of life. So the earlier they get referred, as mm. you well know, mm -hmm. the better these patients do, the more supported they feel, whether we're talking about physical symptoms, psychosocial stuff, existential suffering around you know, illness, I mean, all of these things. So I, I do think that um, while in medicine we, we try to, well, we definitely um, in our medical culture think death is a failure. Um, and, you know, that's, that's how it's taught, you know, uh, to medical students. Mm. I, I think it's changing. I, I, think, I think you're right. And what I see when I, I, I and you're, you work with these guys too, the uh, uh, Hospice Palliative Medicine Associations, uh, AAHPM, uh -huh. uh, and the guys, when you speak to them, they literally are the enemies of suffering. These are people who have dedicated their lives to not just the very end of life, but making the quality of life that you have as long and as high quality as possible. So it's not just about extending life. What we find too is, you know, the hospice holiday and that sort of scenario mm -hmm. where if you if you listen to somebody, if they feel heard, if you address their existential sort of issues, mm -hmm. like I'm a, I'm looking at an abyss towards another side that no human has come back from and told us about that we can document unless you're religious. Mm -hmm. And w how do I deal with that? In one of the movies that you executive produced, and we can talk more detail about that in a bit, but you know, B.J. Miller, who's an amazing doctor and has suffered his own sort of life-changing look into the void, mm -hmm. said, you know, we're hardwired to run from death, yet death is a part of life. So yeah. how do we reconcile that? As a hospitalist, right, we're both paid to do stuff to people. Mm -hmm. Either we RVUs or we're salaried or whatever. And so is relieving suffering, is providing palliative care, is consulting and working with the palliative team uh, doing something in your mind? Is it something that is an intervention in itself? Or is it uh, what uh, you know, some doctors still believe is a kind of a giving up? How oh my goodness, it's absolutely an intervention. I mean, I can tell you from my own personal experience and the data supports it, you know, when you have uh, somebody who, who knows and cares um, coming into a room to talk to a seriously ill patient and their family and really getting to know them as a human being, you know, building rapport, doing the things that, you know, making eye contact, sitting down in a chair, things mm. that doctors are not taught to do. Turns out, you know, a JAMA study came out in 2016 uh, surveying physicians showing that, you know, 70% of them said that they hadn't been trained in how to have difficult conversations with patients. How can that be? <laughs> Blows my mind, right? Yeah. You know, and, and surgeons, we know, spend somewhere around seven, eight, nine, ten years learning how to operate in the operating room. Mm -hmm. We spend zero time teaching doctors how to talk to patients when, when a really thoughtful conversation can change the trajectory of someone's life, just like how a surgery could. You know what I mean? Um, really make a huge impact. And so when I realized that, I was like, oh my gosh, like I don't want to be a cardiologist. I, I want to be a palliative care evangelist. Like this is something that everybody needs to know about and, and talk about and understand. You know, uh, so as a hospitalist, and this is like some confessional stuff that I haven't really <laughs> said publicly, but <clears throat> I always felt that I could be swapped out of my position mm -hmm. with any number of people who could do my job, hospital medicine, as well as I could, and it would be a relatively seamless operation. But what I thought was special that I did was the ability to, I would walk in the room, and I would come, and I would pull up a chair every time I could, and I would turn the pager off, or put it on vibrate, put it away, and make eye contact with the patient and spend time. And those were the interactions that meant something to me, and I hope they meant something to the patients. I got the sense they did. I'm sure they did. And I got the sense that that was not something that was hot swappable with any other random doctor because we aren't trained to do that. The reason it came with my package is my mother's a psychiatrist. That's how she raised me is to sit and talk mm -hmm. and make eye contact. And my dad's a psychologist. There so, you go. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. He's a sports psychologist. <laughs> he is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that sort of, it, it shouldn't be, in my yeah. mind, it shouldn't be that you have to be born with some gift to be able to do that. It seems like we can train Buddhist monks to be 
hyper compassionate, mm -hmm. why can't we train our doctors to sit down, to listen, to read some body language? You know, it, it, you don't have to uh, have an infinite emotional intelligence to be able to learn some of those things. Right. Um, and, and so for hospital medicine, if you can bring that to hospital medicine, mm -hmm. you're already on the 90th part of the bell curve, right? In palliative medicine, if I were going back to full, so now, you know, we were talking earlier, like I see patients at the county hospital a few days a month as a hospitalist with our house staff to try to teach. If I were going back full time to paid clinical medicine, mm -hmm. I would be doing hospice palliative medicine because it feels like that's where I can have the biggest impact. And and so I guess a question I have when I saw, I saw one of the documentaries that you executive produced and we'll talk about how you got about yeah. becoming an executive producer for Netflix document. Like, Tom Heineber on my team, my producer, would love to do that, and he can't do it, and he went to film school. But you were able to do it for two films, both of which had huge impact. Extremis, which by the way, if you haven't seen, it's on Netflix. It's a documentary, Highland Hospital ICU in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And I knew uh, Dr. Bargava, who was uh, in the movie, in that documentary, and it just kind of follows through what it's like in these uh, life, end of life discussions for patients that are struggling to come to acceptance with it yep. and the team that's struggling to even communicate about it. Right. And I remember watching it and getting this visceral reaction like, no, that's not how you have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, that's right. Yeah, do that. Oh, that patient is, oh, and you feel it. Mm -hmm. And then I saw Endgame, which is the recent one. And it was a different level of connection with me mm -hmm. because here was Steve Pantelat, who's one of the attendings at UCSF, palliative care guy, or is he a hospitalist? He's a hospitalist and palliative care. Yeah, it's both. it's it's like right. you. Right. It's that it's the it's the the double threat, <laughs> and then the triple threat is of course the dancing. I haven't told you about the dancing yet. <laughs> Please tell me you dance. I, I sing. The, <laughs> we're gonna do a duet. It's gonna be Ebony and Ebony. <laughs> we're just trying to be a little different, you know. They already did the other thing. So so <laughs> this idea that you know so Steve. Pantalot, who I respect, who was my uh, attending in small group back at UCSF in the 90s, mm -hmm. to see him aged 20 years and so wise and sitting with the family and sitting down and having that conversation. And here was a family that, uh, it was an Iranian Persian family, which is my genetic background, okay. and to see the, the husband's resistance. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I don't want to let her go. You know? and, and the wife, who was the patient, presumably with cancer and bald and in bed with the bruises and the sleeve and everything. It's, it hits so close to what we do, the, the arc of humanity that what we do. I think B.J. Miller used that exact term, yeah. the arch of humanity. And how the heck did you get involved in such a beautiful, I, I imagine that your wisdom somehow infused the angle on that. How did you get involved in that? Well, it actually started with my the involvement with Extremis, the first one on right. End of Life in the ICU. I, you know, I actually, Jessica Zitter is a good personal friend. And, the doctor, um, the attending in that movie, yeah. She's ICU and palliative medicine trained, which is a unique combination, right? And she and I were sitting down having coffee one day and just, you know, in a random conversation, she said to me, did I ever tell you they're filming a documentary in our ICU? And I was like, what? No. And so she put me in touch with the director who'd wow. been there for months, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got buy-in from the hospital um, and and really, you know, had on and off been been a very small team just shooting patients, right? And um, he, uh, Dan Kraus is his name, he mm -hmm. sent me a rough cut of the film, uh, like a five minute. And I remember being on call at the hospital, watching it on my iPhone mm -hmm. um, and being completely blown away. Yeah. Like I'm not a super emotional person. I, you know, kind of have my, you know, game face. Yeah. Um, was in tears yeah. uh, in the unedited, you know, cut of that. And so I thought, gosh, he has something here. Like yeah. this is a story. These are stories that need to be told, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I called him up the next morning. I said, Dan, like this is freaking amazing. Uh, he said, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, we don't have the money to, mm. to do this film. So we're going to put it on the shelf. And I said, no, uh, let's make a movie. So that's how it all came together. I mean, it was it was really very, very far at the end in terms yeah. of, you know, I provided post-production funding. So I was a major funder of the film. And, um, you know, we thought the film would live in the New York Times as an op doc. Right, right, uh, right. Initially. And because uh, at that time, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu weren't buying short docs. Explain what an op doc is. Well, uh, 
like the New York Times does uh, cuts up parts of films mm. and pairs them with pieces of writing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I see. And so right. that yeah, online someone can access, you know, uh, something through, like a short. Video. Yeah, and and this was actually in 2015 before Netflix and Hulu and Amazon had started buying short documentaries. Got it. I think we got really lucky, and obviously the film was wonderful, so that yeah, helped too. Great, yeah. But uh, that, so we were the very first short doc that Netflix ever bought. Wow! So and then we premiered at Tribeca, yeah. won Tribeca, and then we're nominated for an Oscar and two Emmys for that film. And so I hate you so completely much. Completely blew my mind. I got to got to go to the Oscars last year, which was uh, just an amazing, overwhelming. You know what? This interview. <laughs> this interview's over. <laughs> Bye. Here I am. I make videos more or less for a living. No Oscars. <laughs> No Netflix guy. Plenty of time. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Wait, so now this gets me to the point. How does a hospitalist, yeah, not that far out of training? I mean, not. No, a couple years. A couple years yeah. out of training, executive produce. I mean, where was this a family foundation that you guys have? That's my understanding. Is yeah, yeah, and so you were able to channel channel this this sort of, uh, and you 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 have a history of giving in your family ever since yeah. you were young through your dad and. Was that how it was done or how, how did it happen? Yeah, I mean, for sure, you know, growing up, um, my grandmother, um, my father, you know, really, and, and part of my Jewish tradition is mm. about, you know, giving back. So, um, you know, one main tenet of Judaism is what we call tikkun olam, so repairing the world. Mm. Um, and so I feel like that has just been a part of my life forever and maybe one of the reasons I went into medicine because I really wanted to help people. But, I mean, I think... Uh, when I finished residency, I started a philanthropic fund from a family foundation supporting palliative care education. So really yeah. doing the work of training all doctors where I, where I work um, and how to have these difficult conversations, how to think about palliative medicine on the sort of spectrum of sort of people's lives and the course of their illness. And then talking a lot about physician wellness because we, mm. as we know, the rates of burnout in medicine are like through the roof. So um, I've sort of transferred my focus or shifted my focus a bit onto public education, which is how the Netflix docs mm. came about. And really it was through Extremis that I met the team that was doing Endgame. It was a totally different filmmaking team. Wow, and, so uh, they're not related at all. They're just purely, you had the connection through them. Exactly. I was I was on the board of Zen Hospice Project. Got oh where yeah. They had, where they where they were filming. B J Miller's and, project. Yeah. 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 And um, met them years ago, actually, right right as Extremis had had finished. And um, you know, for a few years, talked about what the film could look like. You know, thinking about the right patients to follow. Was it at UCSF? Was it at Sutter? Was it going to be at Zen Hospice? Mm. And um, the you know the film team is Rob Epstein and Jeffrey Friedman, who are multi Academy Award winning documentarians. I mean, mm. they're like legit filmmakers and really were so thoughtful and and really passionate about this topic. And so we even after BJ left Zen Hospice a few years ago. We said, you know, we, we, you know, we want you in the film. You know, this is really important to sort of ground what we're talking about and a lot of his wisdom and thought leadership. And so, yeah, wow. fast forward a couple of years and here we are. That's amazing. So, so in a way, uh, we both took different angles, you and I, to public communication. Yeah. So I took the let's be a professional clown on YouTube, <laughs> evolve that into a professional clown on Facebook, and then try to be a more professional, professional clown on Facebook. You took the philanthropic angle with the organization, with the executive producing of Netflix videos, which reach a lot of people, a lot of people. I can't tell you how many people had messaged me about Extremis, and I hadn't heard about it because I don't watch a lot of TV or a lot of Netflix. And I was like, what is going on here? What is this thing? And I saw it, and then I made the connection, and I was like, wow. And I recently saw Endgame. It only recently was released, mm -hmm. I think, in the last couple, three May months. May 4th. May 4th. May the 4th be with you. I know what you did there. It was a Vader <laughs> thing, people. The Force. Anyway, so when it was, when it was released, I, I, you know, I um, recently took a look at it. And I was, it was a totally different feel in Extremis. And it made you, it was pure emotional resonance. Like, you're not intellectualizing that film. But so much happened in the film. And so, guys, I, I got to say this. Uh, let me put in a plug for this because it is absolute required watching if you work in healthcare or if you don't, you have a loved one, you yourself are wondering what happens at end of life. The conversations they had, it was a fly on the wall kind of thing. It's not like you're sitting there watching a whole ton of interviews. It's just, this is what happens. Yeah. BJ Miller having that conversation with 
the elderly lady who was dying in his office as an outpatient. It's like an outpatient palliative care. Company. UCSF has the most amazing outpatient palliative care program. Yeah. How on earth does that even work? So people come in, they yeah. know they have a life-limiting illness, yep. and they come in and they have these sort of sessions. Yeah, and they manage symptoms, right? So it's right. a symptom management service. That's, that's what, what it they was. That's what they call a symptom management service, um, right? Yeah, it's, it's incredible what they're doing. We call that the dilaudid service at... Uh, <laughs> In, at, uh, well, now it's got to be Vegas. something else because yeah. we can't get the lot of Can't get that la la. That's right. Uh, now it's all Toradol. <laughs> right, right. It's Tylenol. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's Obacalp XR, uh, placebo spelled backwards, but the extended release. <laughs> um, but when, when BJ sat there, and th this to me was one of the most remarkable conversations I've seen another doctor have. He said, she came in and she said, so the assignment you gave me, which was to make friends with death, I failed it. I failed it utterly. I can't do it. I l like being alive. I love being alive. And B.J. Miller is sitting there, and he's this. So if you guys don't know who B.J. Miller is, he's a doctor. He's a little older than me, maybe maybe the same age. Um, really distinguished guy. Has uh, prosthetic legs and uh, is missing a good bit of his left or right arm, I forget, because of a accident he had when he was 19. He was standing on top of a, a train and it was an electric train and an arc of electricity went through his watch and basically fried his legs and his arms and nearly killed him. And that life-changing event he finally came to terms with and came out as an almost enlightened being and is giving back so much to other people. So he sits there and he says, okay, well, maybe let's not make friends with death. Let's have a conversation. Let's develop a relationship with it. And then he goes on to talk about, we don't know what happens when we die. I don't think anyone can know that. So what can we accept? And, 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 and he, he chips away at this relationship with death in a way that was so beautiful. And I remember making notes in my mind going, I'm going to steal that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that with myself when I'm dying. I'm going to do that with my loved ones. It was beautiful. I think that the documentary guys were able to capture this is a rare and wonderful thing. Were you happy when you saw the final product? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it had been many years of filming and trying to find the right patient and the right family to work with right. to tell the story. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I've probably seen it 50 times at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, and, and every time I like it more and more. Yeah, there's something um, else to find There's something there. else yeah. that, you, you know, you sort of connect with in the film and it actually gets more and more sad for me. And I'm, oh. you know, as I said, I'm not an emotional person. So I'm like, what the heck is going on here? It's, it really is beautiful and tells a very true story for people. Um, it's the veracity, the truth of the story, I think, that resonated with me, you know. So I was watching it again this morning because I knew you were coming today. And my family was gone. And, like, there was one scene, and I don't even remember what it was. I've been a little bit hyper-emotional lately because I've been doing a lot of serious pieces, you know, mm -hmm. stuff about kids being left in cars and forgotten mm. and dying and, you know, terrible stuff. So I'm a little primed, but I just got very emotional because these are universal truths. And we see it in the hospital. And you know what we do? So a lot of times we're like, yeah, I'm not going to process that right now because I got another 10 patients to round yeah. on. And like you said earlier, there's a game face, right? Mm -hmm. So we put on our game face and we have to have that because otherwise if we're falling apart all the time, well, first of all, it's not sustainable for us. It probably means we're empathizing more than compassionatizing. Mm -hmm. So we're feeling their pain as our own affective empathy and we're not uh, just uh, kind of detaching one step and feeling love and concern for suffering. And so f feeling that in the documentary, I mean, that's a gift to give others because they feel that and they feel the truth of it, and they may make a change, right? Mm -hmm. Like they may say, I'm gonna have this conversation, or I'm gonna change how I look at this. That's the hope. I mean, mm -hmm. we really want to shine a light in these places, whether it's the ICU or it's you know being in the hospital bed. That woman who, in, in the movie, Mitra, had been sick for, for five years. Wow. So you, you're just catching the, the a end very, very short snippet of time for her, and she'd actually known those providers forever, so yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we really, I mean, I can speak for myself, really want to empower people out there um, to be able to understand sort of what are the questions I should be asking my doctors? What are the what are the conversations I should be having with my family about what matters most to me? Mm. So that, you know, if I'm in that situation, um, I can get care that I want and that I understand and that, you know, is in line with my goals and my values because that's what it's all about. You know, uh, and I'm going to talk to these guys for a second because I think... 
when I watched this documentary, what I realized is there was so much teaching there for how to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not in any way a didactic lecture. It's a, you watch these people who are brilliant mentors, Steve Pantelat, BJ Miller. There was another doc talking about Tamitra, the patient who was dying after you know, five years of struggling with cancer, talking to her about, we want to do a research project where mm -hmm. when she dies, talking to the husband, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we need to look at the organs and see where the cancer is and that may help others fight, uh, you know, with research, et cetera, to prevent this from happening. And to see the families struggle with that. Right. And, and, and I, I remember the mother uh, of Mitra, a wonderful lady, spoke in Farsi a lot uh -huh. and they translated it. Yeah. And, and she was, she thought she was being kind of a sly. She's like, you know, they have me on the camera all the time. She's saying this in Farsi. And then someone told her, you know, in Farsi, they're gonna translate this and it's gonna be subtitled <laughs> out. And she's like, let them translate it, it's truth. Uh, she, she said, she turned to the doctor and said, so w w if this were your loved one, would you do this? Would you let them cut open the body at death and take the organs out and do all this? And the doctor said, I would, I would, but it's a personal thing. Yeah. And she said, I want to do this, but this is my daughter. Right. And so, you know, these are the conversations that they give you, they give you the feeling that you're living a purpose when you practice because you get to have those conversations. And I will say, you know, and, and it's shown in the film, there is a team there, right? So it's not just the physicians, right? We got, we got the nurses, we got the social workers, we have the chaplains, we have a whole kind of wraparound of care for people because it's not just about medical care, right? Mm -hmm. It's all these other things that come into play. And I think palliative care does the best job of any medical service to, to be inclusive and to talk about this team-based approach to caring for people. And a lot of those conversations were from Bridget Sumser, the social worker, who's, yeah. who's boarded in palliative care as a social worker. Yep. And she connected with that family for, for many, many years. And so I think, you know, important to point out that it's, you know, everybody is, is part of the team and making a difference. But yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about that more because when I spoke for AAHPM, AA. Yeah, you got it. A -A -H -A -H, it gets too many letters. <laughs> Just call it like the palliative hospice, cool folks, enemies of suffering. Enemies of suffering, EOS, the EOS Love guys. It. So when I spoke to EOS, uh, I remember talking about Turntable Health Art Clinic and mm -hmm. how it was this team-based approach. So social worker, nurse innovator, we called her, mm -hmm. uh, or him. Uh, physician, health coaches, uh, a, a phlebotomist, everybody on the team taking care of the patient. And I said, you guys were my first introduction as a medical student to what a team-based care looked like. And the reason was, and since then you see it in transplant, you see it in surgical teams, you see it in cancer, but I saw it initially in hospice palliative care at Laguna Honda in San Francisco. Right. And I was a medical student rotating through, I, I think I was second year, so I didn't know what the heck was going on. They throw you in these clinical situations and you're just going, ah! And Laguna Honda was an inpatient hospice for county level patients, as I recall. Yeah, no, that's right. And Zen Hospice Project sends their volunteers there Got to it. care for folks who are, you know, hospice eligible and uh, so near, near the end of life. Got yeah, it. Yeah. And, and so they would sit in interdisciplinary rounds doctors, social workers, case manager, uh, 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 nurses, mm -hmm. uh, everybody who was taking care of the patients, and they would sit in a ta around and they would talk about that patient like they were a member of the family. All the psychosocial stuff and the personality stuff and the resistance and the pain, the medical stuff, and, this, and every single person had an equal voice. Right. And I remember at being instilled in the hierarchy of medicine already as a first year, being crapped on by everybody, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, like everybody's voice is equal in service of the patient. They all bring different gifts. And, and that, that changed the course of how I thought about medicine. Mm -hmm. Because I used to think about it like my dad's kind of medicine, 1.0. Like, it's cowboy doc. Everybody listens. That's bunch of men. Bunch of men. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I, at least I didn't have the bunch of white men because my dad being <laughs> Indian, I was like, okay, they don't have to be white, okay, buddy? But they still have to be men. And so, so all that conditioning started to unwind a little bit when I saw that. And palliative medicine does that best. So in your documentary, you, you show the social worker and they're all sitting there singing and, and they're doing different things for yeah. that specific patient. Where do you feel the hospitalist fits in in that team? You know, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think it depends a little bit on the type of practice that's set up in terms of the hospital. Um, some hospitalists 
sort of also do palliative care. So mm. they're, they're part of that team just naturally. I think in academic medical centers, of course, it's parsed out, you know. Um, and, and because, you know, palliative care is a consultative service, mm. meaning they have to be called in uh, to see a patient. Right. Um, I think the hospitalist plays an integral role in, in, in recognizing, hey, flagging and saying, hey, I think this patient is, you know, would, would benefit from a palliative care consult or a conversation. And it's above my sort of abilities to manage their pain, to talk about sort of discharge planning, to, you know, uh, deal with whatever is coming up that you would need a palliative care provider. So I think it absolutely, I mean, hospitalists are sort of the, the ones that open the door um, for this kind of conversation. We are the key master and the gatekeeper, and Gozer the Gozerian gives us our orders and also our pay. Actually, so it, it, relating to that, I learned the most about constipation management from one of our hospice people. Yep, me too. They are so good at it. Oh, yeah. Because you're on high-dose narcotics, you're, you have other issues that cause slow bowel transit and constipation. And constipation is a life-altering kind of suffering, you guys. Mm -hmm. You wonder why older people are so obsessed with their bowels. Because it determines the course of their day. Am I going to have a good day or a bad day? Yeah. Am I going to be bloated and uncomfortable and in pain? Or am I going to be like, ah, I dropped the kids off the pool the right way. <laughs> and, and these things matter. And that's, I think, uh, one of the magical things about palliative care is they care about subjective human experience, mm -hmm. which is a lot of times ignored. Or at least it's an inconvenient thing. Like, oh, she's having an experience. We, that's not what we deal with. We deal with the skin and the eyes and the organs and the blood and the chemicals in the blood and send it off to the lab. And we don't deal with, how are, how's your day to day? You yeah. know? Uh, how, as a hospitalist, right, you're, you're under a lot of pressure. You got a chart, you got to see patients, you got to block from the ED, <laughs> you got to block from the clinic. Well, how, where is the role of listening to your patient's subjective experience for you? Well, I think, you know, now that I'm done with residency and sort of less harried in terms mm. of, you know, my, my overall way I think about, you know, patient care, I, I am actually very often taking the time to sit down and talk with patients because that's like the best part of my day, or actually for me, it's my night. But um, when I can really connect with people, I think mm. I, you know, I've been given this um, blessing to be able to sit down and talk with people in kind of these really intimate conversations with tr strangers, right? Mm. People I'm just meeting for the first time. But, um, you know, to me, that's what is fulfilling about medicine is to really connect with people on a human level. Um, and I think it's unfortunately really missing for a lot of people. We don't value, as you're saying, mm. these conversations. We're not paid, right, to sit and talk with people. We're paid to do things to people. Yeah. And I think that's really contributing to a lot of the burnout in our profession. Now, speaking of burnout, you are recently married, mm -hmm. from what I read. I'm not a stalker. I'm just... <laughs> How did he know that? <laughs> Dr. Google is my friend. Um, you recently married. You do all this philanthropic work. You're running the End Well you know, Symposium and the organization. You're doing the executive producing. And you're a nocturnal hospitalist, yeah. a nocturnist, if you will. How do you do that all without going crazy? I read something about you were on your honeymoon and you just gave up and started working. Well, I guess I'll preface this all by saying like, the work that I do is so important to me that it brings me a ton of joy. So mm. for me, I don't see it as work. I see it as my, I'm compelled. It's my mm. passion. Um, you know, I, I am lucky in that I work part time. Mm. So I do a handful of nights at the hospital and mm -hmm. the rest of the time I'm off, you know, either traveling or working on other projects. So I, you know, I, I feel lucky that I'm able to do that and really focus on things that I care a lot about. Um, as, as we've talked about. So, you know, it's just like everybody. Um, if I, I feel like if I had to work full time as a physician, I would be way even more burned out. I mean, the work that, that the doctors do who are full time in the ring, just totally insane. Let's talk about that because nurses, doctors, everybody on the front lines, a lot of them are trying to scale back if they can afford to do mm -hmm. that. When I worked full time hospital medicine, I was pretty roasted yeah. by the end. But a lot of people, friends of mine who've dropped to half time, they take a big cut in pay, obviously, but they are so much happier. So is it that there's a certain amount of money that you need to be able to, you know, feel safe and secure and such on? And then after that, it's just, it's just too much pain. You know, in other words, yeah. you can't do those things that you're talking about where you're talking about supporting a cause you care about. You use the word joy. Yeah. And 
you know, I, I always love to think about that word because in our flow state, when we're doing something yeah. we love, joy emerges as a thing. Mm -hmm. And you see it in the comments on my videos. People will say, oh, the best experience I had is this or this and that. And you can feel that joy, but then you can also feel when the joy is not there, when it's a job or when it's a slog or when it's hurtful to them because they're being laterally abused. You know, it, it, there's a lot of stuff in healthcare that is, right. the, the patients can get violent now with the opioid epidemic, with poor mental health services and all right. those things. Well, and I think overarching the whole thing is we're working in this very broken system, mm. right? And everybody feels like whatever part that they're playing, you know, that they're maybe putting a Band-Aid on a much bigger problem or, you know, have a lot of distress mm. about the fact that we can't serve our patients the way that we want to um, or patients can't afford their medicines or, you know, any number of things. And so, you know, absolutely, it's incredibly, healthcare is an incredibly challenging place to be that no one prepares you for in yeah. your training. You know, it's no. just, you, you show up and you're like, Wait, what? They, they, this is how they prepare you. You ask your mentors, hey, would you do it again? What's going on? And they say no. Heck no. They say no, or they say, no, I would go and be an ex or a lawyer or right. a business guy, or I'd go get an MBA, or I'd, I'd leave medical school, I'd go work for a startup, i do this. That's not mentoring. That's uh, talking to somebody for whom the joy has gone. It is not their fault, but there is this systemic thing. And that's one of the missions of our show. That's why I like to talk to people like you, because you found a balance where you recognize system is broken, but instead of complaining, becoming joyless and slogging, you say, you know what, I, I have a few gifts that I'm able to, to work less than full time, which allows me then to do X, Y, and Z mm -hmm. that I care about and you're passionate about and you're changing people's lives by showing them ways to do things that are better. And that's key. Do you think, and, I, and I, a couple of things I wanna make sure I ask you about, one is, the new research on psychedelics uh, like psilocybin, mm -hmm. which comes from mushrooms, LSD, mostly psilocybin, because it's a kinder, gentler psychedelic, so it doesn't have as much of the baggage from the 60s that LSD does. It's come back. Michael Pollan wrote a book called How to Change Your Mind, which I'm about halfway through, which is a transformative book. You should definitely read it, although I'm going to do a full book report when I'm done with it. My husband just started reading it, thinking it was about literally changing like your mind politically, and then was like halfway through, like, wait, what? No, no, it's <laughs> way bigger than like politics is a, is nothing. Yeah, it is nothing compared to what Michael Pollan is talking. About. He's talking about using um, a guided psychedelic trip under medical supervision mm -hmm. with a guide at high dose to literally reboot and have a, 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 a induced mystical experience. Right where you see the true nature of things and go, you know what? Hmm, I'm no longer afraid of death. I'm no longer uh, paralyzed by my grief. Right. I'm no longer paralyzed by my PTSD. And the descriptions of patients who've had these guided trips where their ego dissolves and they see things as they are instead of as our conditioning sort of evolve mm -hmm. is beautiful. What do you think the role will be in palliative care when people are staring at existential issues? Yeah, I mean, I... I definitely am feeling hopeful mm. that we can get past whatever sort of baggage around the use of psychedelics and for recreational purposes that right. this country has. I think in Europe, they've been studying it uh, over the last five years, even more than we have because mm. they have different regulations around this. There's some amazing researchers. One guy, Tony Bosis from NYU, spoke about this at Endwell Symposium last year. Mm. You know, the, the data is really compelling. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they have found something here. Mm. And if we can get out of our own way, um, we can really start helping people. I agree. I agree. And MDMA is another one that I think uh, has some promise. It's a little less untoxic mm -hmm. than psilocybin. So there's some downside. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm listening to pollen and having had my own experiences with those drugs in college. Mm -hmm. They were some of the most significant experiences of my life because you see things, again, your ego kind of dissolves and you see things uh, almost as a child does, but mm -hmm. with wisdom. So whereas a child sees the world unfiltered by conditioning, they also have no no perspective and no wisdom with which to contain that, uh, an adult can have that experience. That's why I think Michael Pond says, those entering middle age or at the end of life mm -hmm. may benefit from these experiences in a guided setting. And then the therapeutic things that we measure, you know, in medicine, like, um, <laughs> well, subjective things, right? Mm -hmm. About, you know, suffering and existential fear and pain and anxiety, things that come with a serious illness diagnosis, those seem to wash away for whatever reason. And there's a lasting effect. So six months out, those people reported very positive feelings, very positive outcomes, and no adverse side effects. That's, Can you think of a drug that you know meets that? It's, it's really amazing. And we always have to watch out because 
you and I will speak about this in effusive terms because we know the potential of the of the research, but uh, it almost it almost uh, we almost have to be careful because I would hate to sabotage this research by being too positive because then sure. people don't think it's real. Yeah. I always worry about how to talk about this because I am a I think that we have to study it. And I've said this about cannabis. I've said this about a lot of things. Just study it, see what works. But with the psychedelics, there's a you know, and Sam Harris talked to uh, Michael Pollan about this. It was an amazing podcast. And, you know, the, the, the idea that there's a gentleman uh, who was, I think he was a journalist. He was dying of pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. had a true existential angst. Like, uh, he couldn't see past this idea of dying. It was mm -hmm. so terrifying. And he had this guided psilocybin trip, and he uh, had a, had a, almost like uh, you know complete dissolution of the ego mm -hmm. saw his death there kind of had a relationship with it right. and also uh, saw his brother or someone who had passed and and was there with him and just really reset his brain and that's why I think he called how to change your mind it's it's like you said right. long lasting reset of how we think now you don't have to do drugs mm -hmm. to get that no. Chaplains can help you. Meditation yeah. can help you. Any pursuit, skydiving can you can have a <laughs> mystical experience sure. that changes your life. Yeah, um, it's just one more tool, you know, potentially out tool. there. Yeah, it's one more absolutely. tool. Absolutely. Yeah, and and so that piece, I definitely, I'm glad I got your perspective on because I think it's important. Uh, the other piece is, you know, there's so much going on now in in public discourse about. Um, you know, the, the sexual abuse and all the other stuff that's happening in various professions. In medicine, you know, I went through the UCSF Stanford Mill, and at UCSF, I, I didn't see this as much, but at Stanford, there was, it was a sort of very patriarchal kind of, um, there were a lot of attending physicians abusing power, mm -hmm. dating medical students, dating residents, uh, a lot of stuff like that that I saw and then a lot of implicit bias which I also have having been conditioned in the 70s and all that as a, a woman going through all that working in San Francisco now in a, in a hospice environment have you encountered a lot of that or has it not been a good question you know where where I trained which actually happens to be where I, I work so Sutter Health CPMC um I didn't actually, mm. you know, we're, you know, I came through 2010 to 2013. Um, you know, I, I think I actually chose CPMC because when I interviewed there, I felt like it was such a positive, diverse, welcoming environment. Mm. So different than I'm, what I've heard like UCSF and Stanford might be. Mm. Um, although obviously I can't speak it's, from it's, my it's own it's experience. It's variable. Yeah. Um, and who knows now what's going on. Um, and interestingly, my entire residency class was female. Really? Yeah. Every single one. All Internal of us. medicine. Internal medicine. So, so times are changing. Oh, absolutely times are changing. And uh, you know, and, and you know, my wife too didn't really encounter that in internal medicine and radiology at Stanford. Mm. But you know, uh, it's interesting because many have and I get a lot of messages and and I think it depends on where you train and, right. and kind of set and setting and those kind of things. Yeah. But, no, it's definitely I don't want to say it's not happening. It it yeah. totally is happening still around the country. I just didn't happen to experience it, thankfully. Right. Um, which is great. Yeah. And and again, that goes to say that like this isn't a u universal thing. It is possible that we can have yeah. you know, uh, 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 both genders doing medicine without tremendous drama and yeah. inequity. That's a goal that we've been looking for for a long time. Yep. And hopefully it can happen. It's interesting because for me, I always have to, I have to recognize my implicit bias because mm -hmm. it's there. I, you know, conditioned in the 70s, two immigrant parents who obeyed very specific gender roles. And so it took a lot of unwinding and occasionally it'll surface. Like I'll make a, a statement like I think I was, there were ants swarming on my feet and I was doing a live out in my parents' place. And I'm like, oh my God, if I start screaming and running like a girl, it's going to be, you know. Sure. And like 30, you know, women got very upset with me about yeah. using that. But you know, the thing is, I'm like, that's my implicit bias. It's going to come yeah. out. And it's yeah. also, you know, it's also how we, you know, we said horrible things when we were kids. You know, we used the R word to talk about people who are developmentally delayed. We did a lot of things. Yeah. So it pops out. So I think partially it's kind of not getting too crazy about that stuff. This is just my yeah. opinion. But, but, Appreciating when people are trying yep. and 
they're trying to uh, progress. And I think there's a lot of implicit bias in, in women, too, about roles and, and things like that. Yeah. So what I will say is very, very often, you know, I'll tell my Uber driver or I'm talking to somebody that I've just met that I work in healthcare and they're like, oh, you're a nurse. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm like, right. no, I'm a doctor. And they're like, oh, you know, it just kind of like blows their mind. Um, right. It's rare that somebody, say, you know, hears me say I work in healthcare and goes, oh, you're a doctor. Right, right, right. Um, when it happens, I'm like... Yes. I know. Finally. Thank you. Your, finally. Mother, your mother must be a doctor. Um, and patients often too. You know, when I walk right. into a room, even though I have my white coat on, uh, I still wear my white coat. Um, you know, they're like, oh, hello. You must be the nurse. Um, you know, happens all the time. It does. For some, that bothers them a lot. And so I've had a lot of messages about that, that confusion being a really a, a fundamental problem for them because they are also struggling to find their identity in this massive system like we all do. Yeah. And for them, it wasn't a... A good thing. Do you? How did the nur How did the nurses treat you when you were training? I'm curious. Oh my God, nurses are some of my closest friends. Wow. Yeah. I, I got great. super lucky. You know, again, that I trained in a place where people are generally pretty happy. Yeah. Um, and nurses were super helpful. I can't even tell you how many times I asked the ICU nurses what the heck I was supposed to be doing yeah. as as a new resident. Um, I literally didn't know, you know, anything. Um, so I, I very rarely have had issues with nurses. I actually love them and, and super value their insight and think that, you know, they're the real, to me, they're the real heroes in medicine. Just the, yeah, they're, they're doing, doing it the every work. day. They're doing, they're doing the day. work, yeah. And that's how, that's how I felt, you know, and so often it's an antagonistic relationship one way mm. or the other. And because I hear a lot of this stuff too, again, because we have, you know, being, having our platform, there's a lot of inbound. So I get hundreds of private messages a day and wow. it's, can you talk about this this happened to me here's a story that happened to me and more often than not people want just want their story heard yeah. by somebody that they think can understand it and so I listen to the story uh, I may not be able to respond but I read every message and so but but I then get a good sense of wow maybe where I trained this never happened mm -hmm. but boy this is a big mm -hmm. problem you know, like community hospital versus academic, sure. right? Big dichotomy. Well, in the West Coast and East Coast, we're Huge. very lucky in the way we think about things. Maybe, you know, in the places in the middle, there are still serious issues that they're facing that we haven't thought about in years. That's but... true. And and even East Coast versus, versus West Coast sure. academic environments are yep. so different. Absolutely. Hopkins versus UC. Sure. Uh, it, it, it's really, really interesting. Um, what, when and if you have spawn? like Doc Vader had um, Leia and Luke, <laughs> if you have children, what would be your advice to them about medicine if they showed an interest in it? Oh, man. Well, so I don't want children. So Good I, for I, you. I like to put that out there because, you know, a lot of people also get surprised that, you know, where are your kids? You're almost 40. I'm like, well, not not for me, um, at least not in this lifetime. So I didn't want them either. My wife strong armed me into it, oh, yeah. and then I had them, and I'm like, okay, oh, I'll take, I'll yeah. take them, I'll take them. But yeah. no, but I understand that yeah, perspective. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm torn about the medicine thing. You know, right when I finished training, I was so burned out, yeah. right? I was like so disillusioned by it all. I pretty much just said, I said to my dad, I'm like, if you ever have anyone talk to me about whether they should go to medical school, I'm going to tell them no. Hell no. no. Yeah. Um, you know, I still feel like it is objectively yeah. such a huge investment of your time, your emotional energy, your, your money that you have to really be committed, right? It has to be something that you fully kind of, as much as you can, yeah. have a grasp of what you're getting into. And so what I always like to say to people and the advice that was given to me that only now makes sense because I'm done, yeah. is if there's anything else that you would be fulfilled <laughs> and happy doing, yeah. Go do, do it. that. Do it first. Um, and I think especially for women, right? Mm. So we're talking a lot about women. I think it's a different conversation for women because you know, from our, from the age of mid twenties to mid thirties, that's a time in your life that, you know, biologically, if you are interested in children, mm. um, or partnering, whatever, like those are years that are really hard. Um, yeah. I can't tell you how many, you know, my, my, I miss my best friend's wedding. I miss the birth of their children, you know, because I was a resident and you don't get sick days. You definitely don't get time off to go see your friends. Mm. Um, and so, and maybe that speaks to sort of issues in medical education, but I think for women, it's a slightly different conversation than for men. Um, but I, I, you know, I think you're right. And I think another thing that we don't talk about a lot is because women delay having children right. to finish their training, 
there are fertility issues and then you know that, that are increasingly mm -hmm. common so now you have to do expensive fertility treatments and you have to go through all of that and There's plenty of people have kids during residency yep. i will say yep. there was many women in my program that got pregnant and they just figured it out you know i right. can't say it was easy by any means right. i can't even imagine how they got through I it i can't imagine you it. can do it <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. really hard and yeah. you people do more often than not end up delaying but some people say what well, having the kids grounded them and gave them a sense of purpose and meaning mm. that i certainly lacked like purpose yeah. and meaning was a tricky piece you said when you finished residency you were super burned out man i'm with you on that oh yeah i have never been that burned out yeah. as the day i finished third year I, i'm that. still recovering yeah I'm oh yeah five years out sure you know it's i'm i'm serious like i it, I'm, I'm a very different person you know than yeah. i was when i started and um in some good ways but also in some, some not so good is, yeah. ways and you know i think this gets back to the importance of talking about this and finding, you know, thinking about ways that people can have balance in their lives and finding mm. joy in their work because, you know, we, we have 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day in this country. Those people are going to need care. Um, mm. And if we don't figure out a way to keep, yeah, keep the no. doctors and the nurses and everybody else p practicing, you know, who the heck's going to care for them? You know, that joy piece, because you're right. When I finished residency, man, I was, I told my residency director, great guy named Kelly Scaff. At oh Stanford. yeah, I know. You know I Kelly? interviewed with him for residency. They didn't pick me. I do the best <laughs> Kelly Scaff impersonation. Kelly, if you're watching, um, we, we need to teach <laughs> the learners how to learn, how to teach the teachers how to be taught. And <laughs> I think that's what separates Stanford from other programs is that we teach the teachers to teach. You know he's going to see this, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> and I love him. He's really, truly one of the great mentors. And and But what um, what I told Kelly at the time was like late second year is like, I wanted to do GI. Now I hate GI. I did the rotation. The idea of doing this for a living makes me want to gouge my eyes out. Yep. Um, being a hospitalist sounds like a cop out. Like it, to me, it felt like, yeah. you know what? It's just more residency hell to the no. Primary care, have you seen the amount of documentation they have to do? And the other specialties just didn't interest me. So I said, well, crap. So I ended up like taking a year off after residency, which infuriated my program because it messes up their numbers. Yeah. Because I mean, oh, he didn't, you know, he didn't go and do anything. Fellowship? So what? I went and worked for a couple startups okay. and did like this sort of uh, medical tech stuff. And this is what I realized doing that. We were talking about joy. You're sitting there going, oh, you know, we're going to generate a profit uh, and we're going to bring this product to market and it's going to impact this many people. And you're just sitting there going, you know what? I used to save lives. Yeah. I used to sit at the bedside and hear people when they were at their most vulnerable. And now I'm sitting here listening to this guy Sundar tell me about, you know, technical deep dives and field level traction, <laughs> and it means nothing to me. And yeah. and and that's when I realized, okay, I'm done. This right. hospital skit came up. I'm like, you know what? It was a cop out. I'm copping out. I'm gonna do it. I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. You know what it was? You said something earlier where you get to now you get to come back and kind of spend that time if you want. Mm -hmm. you, you know, hospital medicine's nice that way because there is some flexibility. You run the room. There isn't an administrator yelling at you, telling you to stop spending that time right. Right, as much. So being, being back in that space and then being a mentor to the little younglings yep. is a great thing. And yeah. you teach now, right? I do, yeah. yeah. I, I am back at the place where I train. So we have, we have residents, we have brand new that's interns what I did. actually yeah, that's this, what I did. this month. And uh, yeah, I get to work with them at night. So. Yeah, yeah. How do you like nights? So it's funny. I, I actually hate being up all night. I'm right. somebody that loves getting tons of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, my ideal bedtime would be like 9.30 mm -hmm. if I was, That's mine you know. too, yeah. Um, but what I realized my second year, I did a bunch of night float admitting. So just admitting at night. Yeah. I loved admitting. Yeah. I love it. Just straight admitting. I love yeah. undifferentiated patients where you yeah. don't know what's wrong <laughs> and you got to figure it out. Right? Yeah, it's yeah, that, yeah. that puzzle, that intellectual challenge of medicine that I really love. Yeah. Um, and so I realized that you can really only do that at night. Yeah. You know, as a hospitalist. Yeah, yeah, Unless yeah, there's yeah. you know some weird kind of thing where you can be a daytime admitter or full time. Which some people don't do really that, do but that. it's not yeah, it's um, not normal. So at night you get to admit all night long and like that's what I love. So, so that's why I do it. So I used to so I used to do nocturnal shifts for extra cash. Mm -hmm. It was like a thousand bucks a night or something. And so you go and do, you admit all night. And mm -hmm. it was like, I loved it. I would sit up in that little Stanford call room and it was just like being a resident again, but I knew that I didn't have to go in in the morning and see all those patients. Right. And I would just admit, and you know, the ER would call and I was friends with them. Yeah. And it was a relationship. Yeah. And it was like us against 
disease and trying to figure out what's mm-hmm. going on and to challenging patients and th- that kind of thing again you talk about joy joy emerges in the strange places yeah. sometimes it emerges at three in the morning where are my night shift people out leave some comments on this if you're a night shift person so all that being said i want to respect your time because you drove all the way from san francisco down to the peninsula to spend some time with us which we deeply appreciate you are definitely somebody off the bell curve in terms of what you're doing. And as a fellow hospitalist, I have nothing but mad love for everything you're doing in palliative care, in hospital medicine, in communication. Uh, any parting words for the for the pack? Oh, man. I'm going to leave links to End Well. I'm going to leave links to your documentaries. Yeah. 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 I don't have any lasting words. I think, you know, for me, um, figuring out how to find balance in my life uh, through through this work and the things that I'm passionate about, which are kind of serious illness and end of life, have really made all the difference um, and turned a really burned out, angry person into somebody who gets up every day with a smile on my face and I get to challenge myself to learn new things all the time. Um, so That's a nice way to end this. <laughs> Thank you, darling, for everything you do. z do me a favor. This is a podcast as well because it's long. So if you want to chill out and check it on the road, that is on iTunes. Search for Incident Report. We're on SoundCloud, we're on Stitcher, we're on all those things. If you like this format, leave some comments. We'll do more in-depth interviews with really cool, interesting people that aren't me for change because <laughs> I used to be the only interesting person I knew until uh, <laughs> I met anybody else. So that all being said, Shoshana Ungerleiter, thank you for everything you do. And Thanks uh, for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And go check out Endgame on Netflix. Watch Extremis on Netflix. And you have new stuff coming up soon? Hope to. It'll be on my website. No doubt. Okay. And we'll put a link to the website as well. 